more than half the world's populations live in cities. So two sessions from the Water Convention and the Water Leaders Summit were devoted to the discussion on the growth of cities into megacities and how future generations would sustain their living environment. I'd argue that we are really in a special point of time. The good news is that upper income countries have really revolutionized public health outcomes. But I think there's some bad news here. In other parts of the world, in fact, most other parts of the world, the systems that were built were built for narrow objectives with little resilience and really are not up to speed for the challenges ahead. We are going to, whether we like it or not, in most parts of the world, need to think about big time innovation in water production, doing more with less, moving across a whole set of different resource options on the demand and the supply side, and we're going to deal with a, a major shift from dealing with single source deterministic environments to probabilistic multiple source environments. We've got a lot of work to do. And I'm optimistic. I actually think we can move this ball. In the long run, I believe this is not simply a matter of getting rich. This is a matter of whether our children will be fighting wars over water decades from now. With water efficiency, it's very much about bringing the community with us. So we are looking to savings within the community, with industry and within agriculture. We have a waterized rebate program so that people will actually put in water efficient devices into their homes. And just a simple example, we provide a waterized rebate of $150 for people buying water efficient washing machines. One thing was clear as we envisioned the cities of the future. We could not simply discuss or debate the future. We had to plan, take action, and then measure results. Yes, mistakes would be made, but lessons were learned. The greatest mistake would be not taking action. In my view, um, whether we like it or not, most of us in water management are following behind land use development and providing the plumbing. Um, and and uh, the decisions are made regarding land use, and we figure out how to get water there, take water away, and make sure that the, pro the property is properly drained. We've got to participate earlier in the land development process. We have got to be part of land use decisions. I want to ask you, are you addressing the right questions? Are you addressing the right issues? Are you looking at the right trends? My answer listening yesterday and today, this morning, I would say partly. There are some very fundamental issues which we have forgotten or which are not discussing. But the one hand we're seeing urbanization, the other hand, at least in some of the major countries, we're seeing extensive ruralization. How we're going to provide water supply, health services, education to these exploding rural communities, we haven't a clue. One of the six key pillar events was the business forums that offered insights into emerging water markets. At the Middle East Business Forums, three memorandums of understandings were signed on environmental and water cooperation between Singapore and the United Arab Emirates as well as Bahrain. After the break, hear from the man who charted Singapore's water story. The highlight of the Water Week was the inaugural Lee Kuan Yew Water Prize Ceremony. The international award was presented to Dr. Andrew Benedek for his development of the low-pressure membrane technology, a technology that has benefited both developed and developing countries. But before the award was given away, Minister Mentor engaged in a lively dialogue with distinguished guests. So I'll begin briefly by telling you why I thought water was crucial to Singapore's survival. We were cut off from Malaysia when the British returned in 1945. We fought the British and said, let us get back into the hinterland. And they finally agreed in 1963 by throwing in the Borneo territories, Sabah and Sarawak, to balance the 
indigenous and the migrant populations, and Malaysia was born. But within two years, the Malay leaders in Malaysia decided that this was not an arrangement that they, felt, they thought terrible, and they asked us to leave. When they told us to leave, I made sure that they would honor the water agreements which had been entered between Johor and the Public Utilities Board of Singapore, the Johor State Government. There were two water agreements, one expiring in 2011 and another expiring in 2061. But a few days after independence, the Prime Minister of Malaysia told the British High Commissioner, if Singapore doesn't do what I want, I'll switch off the water supply. Of course, it was meant to be passed on to me, and it duly was. So the quest began for water independence. I set up a unit in my office, and I had a very good engineer who was head of the department. And we set out systematically from day one, 1965, let's get every drop of water in Singapore made portable. <laughs> Very difficult task. Impossible. I never believed it would be impossible forever. I thought sometime, someplace, technology will be found that will make it nearly possible. All the clean catchments were dammed up, all streams, and so from one, two uh, reservoirs, it became 14 reservoirs, varying sizes. The biggest of them all was the marina with two rivers, two sewers, the Singapore River and the Kalang River. Between the chief engineer and I, we decided that we'll clean up these two rivers. It took 10 years, and the fish came back to the rivers. Then we reclaimed the land at the mouth of these two rivers. And we said, I said to them, one day that will be a freshwater lake. They said, no, too toxic. Look at the heavy density of population there. <laughs> we'll have poisons in the water supply. I said, one day we'll have some technology that will get us out of this.